This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Bingo. And now we begin Wednesday, okay, with Energy Hawaii, the state of clean energy. Uh, welcome to our show and welcome to our special guest, uh, Chair of the PUC, Randy Iwasi. Thanks for coming down, Randy. Well, it's good to be here, Jay, old yeah. friend. Great to see you. Yeah, we're getting old together. <laughs> yes, we are. So we're going to we call the show today, What's on the Horizon for the PUC in 2018 and at SEC? And we're going to go, we're going to talk about uh, what can we expect in the new year? What can we expect after that? Uh, what new developments at the PUC and around the PUC? Uh, and what can we expect in terms of the outreach of the PUC, the legislature, the community, the industry, and so forth. If you want to ask a question or make a comment, you can tweet us at ThinkTechHI or call us at 374-2014. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> we're going to talk about here in the state of the energy, uh, what's going on right now. Uh, so my first question is to, to Randy, what is the state of the PUC? Are they the state of the state, the state of the judiciary, the state of the PUC? Well, we're busy. Uh, we have, um... We, we were busy the whole year. We issued a whole lot of very significant decisions, PSIP being one, the uh, tech track uh, phase two decision in the DER docket. We are also now um, undertaking to uh, the dockets dealing with uh, uh, rate increases. We have HECO, MECO, HELCO. Uh, we have uh, Hawaii Gas. And, um, you know, I guess at some point in time, KIUC will be coming in. And those yeah. are... Uh, extremely, uh, uh, I wouldn't call it difficult, but they're complex, yeah. time-consuming, yeah. and it, it uh, requires a lot of uh, staff work on it. Yeah, it's technical, isn't it? Because they, they, if they if you want to make a request for a rate increase, they have to justify it within certain parameters. Can you can you talk about what those parameters are in general? Well, I can give you a real ge real general. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> we are duty bound to ensure that the rate, first of all that the companies have a fair and reasonable rate of return. And uh, the other side is to ensure that the rate payers, the charge to the rate payer is fair and reasonable. Easy words, but uh, tough to parse out when yeah, sure. we go through, dig down into it. Um, <clears throat> you know, people find uh, there's always a complaint. I was one of the complainers when I was retired. Um, if, if, if there's a cost increase, if there's a rate increase. And, you know, it's easy to say no rate increase, but that's not what the statute allows us to do, <clears throat> nor is it um, something that is, uh, I think, uh, good for Hawaii. Uh, the company, we are not here to, ins to watch over the demise of a utility because they do not have a fair rate of return. Right. And so um, we have to make those tough calls, and we're going to make them. Yeah. Okay, important, because we have, to, we have to maintain the economy, we have to maintain the industry. Oh, yes. <clears throat> so there will be increases, but we don't know, we don't really have, have an idea about Well, I, I don't want to say if there will be a, that. yeah. Uh, although we just, um, Helco has, was had the first case, they're before us. Yeah. Um, we have to make a decision within a certain period of time, or if we can't do it, or if the parties agree to extend beyond that deadline, we can issue what's called an interim decision. And um, so what we did in the HECO, HELCO case, there is a settlement that was agreed to, with, with, except for a couple of parts. Um, and so we have an interim decision. We allowed for a rate of retur uh, return on equity for HELCO of 9.5%. Uh, um, and so there is, a, there at least, an increase. Yeah. You know, I don't know if I asked you this the last time we met, but uh, do you foresee a time when rates around the whole state could be uniform, island and island? That, that's something I think um, we can look at. I, I know what I want to do, we haven't been able to do it, is before we get to that kind of uniform rate, is a performance-based rate making. Yeah. Um, I think that is something we have to do uh, to incentivize the utilities to be partners, a bigger partner, a more encouraging partner, a enthusiastic partner in um, adjusting their business model so that uh, rates, uh, renewables, will be at the top of their list. Yeah. So we're going to be doing that. Uh, we just well, have What is performance-based? What does that mean? Well, it looks, 
it'll incentivize you to, if you achieve certain benchmark, um, for example, the income you keep, um, you can keep it. We're not going to be second guessing you. Yeah. Uh, that's a very simple explanation of performance-based rate earning, but there are incentives in there. One of the key incentives and the motivating uh, force behind it all is how are you uh, serving the public? Um, how are you helping to meet our renewable energy goals? Um, I'm, I, I personally, for me, I, I, I am not satisfied uh, with uh, the RAM program that was approved. I don't think that has been something that has incentivize utilities, the utilities to uh, encourage customers to use uh, renewables or to buy more PVs, What is that program? Uh, it's rate, RAM, uh, rate adjustment mechanism, there's another called RBA. Okay. And what was, that was part of the decoupling um, uh, okay. cases that were, were in, the, in the past. Okay. Well, I mean, I, I think we're at an interesting spot. You, you mentioned you use the word partner, and I really like that. I mean, do, do, you, do you see, does the PUC see the utility, or for that matter, the industry as a kind of partner going forward? For example, a couple of years ago, <clears throat> the PUC issued what they called, what, what you called, uh, inclinations in one of your decisions. And I thought that was, uh, you know, that was advice. Uh, it was expectation. It was like having a conversation, kind of, you know. Um, do you see that kind of... Um, that kind of relationship uh, increasing going forward, a kind of partnership, a, a statement of inclinations and expectations? Well, you know, the last time I was on the program, Jay, I, I talked about us, this, us being in a one canoe. We, we are. I mean, we both understood that we're out here in the Pacific Ocean. We, we can't get electricity or power from the mainland or from another state, or we can, nor can we export it when we have too much. We have to deal with the issues that we have here um, by ourselves. And so uh, it would be foolish and counterproductive if each of us in the canoe viewed the other as a, as a competitor and an enemy um, in the worst case scenario. We are part of this canoe. We have to row this, or row this canoe together. And um, so that's how I view it. The utility is, uh, is not an enemy. The utility is not a bad thing. Uh, you, you can talk about what kind of utility should be here, but um, you know there's always this talk about having a, a, a cooperative, for example. Um, that's fine. We'll look at it, but we have to ensure that first. I go back to what I said at the outset: the rates paid by the customer are, f are just and fair. The return to the utility is just and fair. Now. For the, I think for the short haul run, uh, the near future, there, there are going to be cost increase. And um, I think the PUC is going to have to take it on the chin a few times because we're going to be having to make those decisions. But if we don't do that, I, we're not going to have a modernized grid. We're not going to have uh, utility scale solar. We're not going to have um, uh, incentives for customers to uh, put PVs on the roof if we don't make these investments now. Yeah. And we can kick this can down. The, in fact, the can, we are now holding the can that others have kicked down the road. <laughs> and um, The buck stops here. It does now. <laughs> uh, if we want to proceed uh, and achieve, proceed in a, in, a, in a competent way and achieve the uh, renewable portfolio standard goals, we can do it. Yeah. Uh, and that is something that is the legacy our generation can pass on to the next, but our generation will have to make some sacrifices so that the next generation can have a better energy future than we have had. Oh, you're touching me, Randy. Thank you for that. Oh, yeah. you're welcome. So, uh, the PUC, state of the PUC, do you have enough uh, staff? Do you have enough resources? Do you have enough money? Do you like your new digs? Um, is the PUC, um, you know, getting appropriate respect from those who would fund it or not? Well, I, I don't. I don't know about respect. I mean, um, that's well, for each appropriate of, funding. Well, the funding last session we did not <clears throat> get all that we had asked for. Um, we're making do. Uh, we're going to finish this year, and we're not going to be asking for a, a bump in money. I, we think we can make it through, but you know we have. Uh, but we'll see. Uh, like I said, we have four rate cases uh, at at least, and. 
The staffing, and I, we've talked about it the last two times I've been on the program. Yes, we've increased the staffing, but they're young. They need the experience. Uh, they have to develop the expertise. Uh, we want to bring in the consultants, so we need consultants so that not only can they provide us with the expertise that they have, but they can mentor our young staff. The other thing is, um, <clears throat> and, and I, I faced it when I was at the Attorney General's office 40-something uh, uh, years ago. You're in, this, in a profession that is highly prized and competitive. And so when you're a young person, you come in to, say, an AG off, the Attorney General's office, mm -hmm. looking to get the experience, to make a <coughs> name, so that in two years, three years, you can go off into private sector. The same thing happens with us. Sure. We have prof a professional staff uh, who, are, uh, highly, who, who will become highly skilled uh, in a specialized area. Or they already have skills, and so they become very attractive. Yeah. The money competition out there is we're always going to lose. Yeah. Government will always lose. Yeah. And so we, we try to retain them. We're going to continue to try to retain them with better pay, with uh, better training. But um, it's, it's sort of like I've come to the conclusion that we're like a college football team. <laughs> you know, the kids will come, uh, the players will come, and then they're going to leave. They're going to graduate. They're gonna, <laughs> yes, they're going to graduate. And so you just got to restock. Yeah. And it, it's not a knock on it on any agency when that happens. Yeah. It's a fact of life. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you mentioned earlier that <clears throat> you have you have utilities. You're going to you're going to uh, regulate the utilities. You mentioned of course electrical generation and distribution and and gas for that matter. But you also regulate uh, transportation. You regulate so you don't know all the things in transportation. Um, you have a lot of regulation to do. Would it be better going forward if that kind of got separated out because your mainstream your mainstream obligation, I would say, is energy. Yeah? Well, that has long been uh, um, a discussion preceding me uh, in telecommunication, in uh, motor carriers. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think there's an argument to be made on both sides. Uh, in the case of motor carriers, uh, will competition alone without regulation be enough to keep the prices down uh, to keep the quality of service up, yeah. uh, and maybe there is. On the other hand, there is, there is still a need for where would a complainant go to? And that's where you may want a governmental entity there to ensure that their complaints are addressed. In the case of telecommunication, the feds, uh, and I didn't know this when I came in, and I still don't know the full extent of it, but they've basically preempted the area. Um, uh, on cell phone. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we still have some regu regulations on landlines, but the cell phones, I mean, it's no longer a certificate of need and necessity you come to us for. It's a certificate of registration. You come to us, say, we're going to do a sales, um, a service, so you sign us up yeah. and give us a certificate of registration, yeah. and we're going to operate. We have little authority over them, and yet the public expects us to do something, yeah. and it's rough to tell them, well, we, we can't. Yeah. Um, we don't have this regulation. Uh, you take the case of, of Sandwich Isle, um, you know, we, we determine whether or not they qualify for uh, certain federal subsidies because they're servicing a needed area. But all of that, all of the rules and regulations come from the feds. We have no statutory authority mm. to go after them. Mm. So wouldn't it be better to clarify that and, and call you the... Uh, Public Utility, Public Energy Commission. I'm just making that up, uh, and then you know relegate these other things, um, you know, motor carriers and and uh, telecommunications to some other agency or agencies, and let you focus on what is the most important initiative in our state, in our economy, that is energy. Well, I think that is something that I would really consider. Um, it, you know, I haven't sat down and had an um, policy argument or debate or, or discussion about the, intimately about the pro and cons of separating us away from telecommunication and, and uh, motor carriers. But I will tell you that, you know, I sit there at times and I go, well, why are we doing this for telecommunication? Um, a lot of the motor carrier stuff, the registration with us, um, uh, we just fire it off. Just it's almost, it's almost, yeah, it's almost pro forma. Yeah. Um, 
And um, so, you know, there, there, like I said, there is, there is an argument to be made for e in each of the categories for moving it away or just not regulating yeah. it. Well, we're going to have a break in a minute, Randy, but I want to ask you one more sort of systemic question, and that is uh, about your new appointment, uh, Jay Griffin, who I like very much, a nice guy, uh, and he's been here a couple times. Um, how has the mix, if you can say, among the commissioners changed because of the introduction of one brand new commissioner among a group of three? Yeah. Um, you know, Jay was there before. Yeah. Um, and we were, we were very fortunate at the PUC. Tom Gorak was a very competent uh, commissioner and um, with a certain skill set and experience that we're missing at the PUC. Jay Griffin, uh, I, we, that's why I say we're very fortunate. We were very fortunate that he was willing to step up after, after all of that had happened to Tom to say, okay, I, I'm willing to put my neck out there. And he, uh, he brings a different skill set uh, from a personality standpoint. Uh, he's not a lawyer but he has a, a lot of knowledge in, in the uh, policy area. He was one of the authors of Inclinations. And so he has that kind of vision. Yeah. And he has been an outstanding addition uh, to the PUC at a, at a personal level and at a professional level. Yeah, yeah you were talking about losing uh, your members of the football team over time. They graduate and all this. Good. So it's good to have expertise right there yes. within the appointed commissioners. Yes, at, at, particularly at this point in time, uh, Jay, because I go back to what I said earlier. The staff that we have hired are young, and it is, it is good. Jay trained many of the people who remain left on the research policy side. Yeah. Uh, the, the one who's heading it now, um, Dave Parsons, uh, was also under Jay. Uh, so um, it is important to have someone with that knowledge, that skill set, uh, there to be uh, a mentor. Um, in, in, in many cases, he's my mentor. Yeah. I mean, I did not come in with the kind of information he had. So I'm always in his office, or he's in mine, and I'm asking questions. <laughs> That's great. And that's Randy Iwasa. He's the chair of the PUC. It's great to have him on the show. We'll be right back after this short break. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Aloha, I'm Carol Mon Lee, Think Tech Hawaii's Volunteer Chief Operating Officer and occasional host, and this is Minky. For the first time, Think Tech Hawaii is participating in an online, web-based fundraising campaign to raise $40,000. Give thanks to Think Tech will run only during the month of November, and you can help. Please donate what you can so Think Tech Hawaii can continue to raise public awareness and promote civic engagement through free programming. I've already made my donation and look forward to yours. Please send in your tax-deductible contribution by going to this website, www.thanksforthinktech.cosbox.com. On behalf of the community enriched by ThinkTech Hawaii's 30-plus weekly shows, thank you, mahalo, and shishia for your generosity. Okay, we're back on energy on Hawaii, the state of clean energy, uh, with the PUC, the PUC chair, and that is Randy Iwasi. Um, again, thank you for being here, Randy. Uh, we're going to talk about some, uh, some of the issues now. Uh, for example, I think the PSIP, the uh, Power Supply Improvement Plan, it's, it's a big deal, isn't it? Uh, it was long in coming because it was back and forth for about four or five years. And then finally, you know, it's like the smoke comes out of the Vatican. You know, <laughs> yes, we have approval of PSI. What does it mean to you? Uh, well, it's over. I mean, that part is over now. We, have ex we, ex we did not approve everything, though. We accepted the plan. And now it's up to the, uh, and it was a strategic plan. You tell us so that we, when we look forward, moving forward, what kind of acquisitions can or should be made. And now it's up to the utilities, now that we've closed the docket, accepted the plan, uh, to say, okay, now we're going to get down to business. Yeah. You start showing us what you're going to be doing yeah. and when you're going to do it, 
uh, and then we can make determinations about your expenditures, the directions. So it provides us at least that kind of a uh, roadmap. Um, and for the utilities, uh, you told us what you wanted, you told us what you're going to do, now do it. Yeah. Well, what level of granularity you have going forward? I mean, how, how much detail do you need to have and approve of the implementation of that PSA plan? Well, if, if they're going to be buying, making a huge capital expenditure, that each, each of these things are going to be in separate pocket. We will look down on it. Like we do, we will dig, drill down into it because we, we have to make a decision whether or not that capital expenditure is appropriate, whether we should allow that capital cost to be passed on to the rate base, when we look at uh, um, those kinds of things in each docket, we will get down deep into it. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> okay. Um, so what, what in general is pending now in the way of implementation of the PSIP? <clears throat> what's on your desk? You don't have to tell me I got a rule. Don't tell me that. No. But, but tell me what's there. Well, I don't think there's anything specific now that uh, they've submitted to us. But I will tell you what we, are, what we have done and uh -huh. what's out there now is you know a, a month ago we issued our uh, the request for proposal we started the competitive bidding process that is that can be very exciting uh, the the utilities have now sent to us their RFP uh, draft we're getting comments on it and now it's up to the utilities to go out there when when we act on it to go out there and um, um, secure the kinds of developers that we hope that they secure in the various kinds of uh, energy production. Now, I will say this: we are um, what we're looking. We are wanting to get projects off the ground under this process, so that developers can take advantage of the federal tax credit. So we're we're looking at time that importance. That ends in what 2018? 20, 2019. 2019. So there's a time, a, a time focus for us in that RFP. This is not the last RFP process that we're going to go through, but for this one it is. Yeah. And so that's the first thing. It's a time uh, sensitive issue. The second is we are energy technology neutral. So we are not ordering the utility that you have to do solar or you have to do wind or you have to do uh, um, hydro. Uh, we hope that they do uh, because that's part of the PSIP that they talked about mm -hmm. and um, um, that is something that will help us greatly to move towards our uh, achieving the uh, RF, RPS goals. So are you, are you seeking diversity or will you just uh, entertain any possibility that they may feel is a good diversity? Well, what I'm hoping for, because that is their, that they're going to go out there with the RFP, yeah. that they take into account what we had commented upon in the RF, in the PSIP, that hydro is important. Right. Um, we're not looking only at solar. We are not looking only at wind. That we want you to look at as well energy storage, which is going to become a very important component. Yes. Both for utility scales, uh, energy production, as well as uh, individual homes. Yes. Uh, so we're hoping. That, for example, they come in with, if they come in with a project like Kawhi's Tesla or AES, it's it's going to be a good thing, I think, all around. We don't know what they're going to come in with, and um, we're also hopeful. I'm hopeful that there is going to be a diversity of developers. That it is not going to be just the utility, as that's going to uh, build it, run it, own it, and distribute the power, mm -hmm. because our our charge. Part of the, the, the policy framework is diversity of energy, diversity of energy sources. Yeah. Sure, and that's, that's better for resilience, for sustainability in the state, to have an energy system that will, that will be able to keep on going even if, there are, even if there are natural disasters and all that. Well, it's also, uh, Jay, uh, you know, if you have this monolithic 20th century uh, utility structure, which I think we're all trying to move away from, I don't know about the utilities, but we're trying to move away. Because th there is value, intrinsic value, in having a 21st century utility model that is diverse. That, um, and whether what can work in Hawaii, we don't know, because we're not like, uh, again, on the mainland. But should, the, the questions that have been raised is, should it, we have a 
uh, mon monopolistic utility that runs, the, produces the power, distributes the energy? Or should there be other independent power producers that you purchase from? Or, you know, so on, and the discussion can go on and on. But that is a discussion that I think will continue as we move forward. And it is not anti-Hawaiian Electric, it is not anti-KRUC, anti-Hawaii Gas. It's looking at what would be the best fit for this state as we move forward. Yeah, and this is, that's a really sexy question because we're unique. People see us as a laboratory with advanced thinking, advanced ideas, and advanced um, open-mindedness, if you will. Um, and it's, it's a sexy question. You're making history, Randy, honestly. Well, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, yeah, we'll but see you what, are. <laughs> we'll see what the historians write. <laughs> <laughs> so what about, uh, you know, we have some, some developers, you know, who can't make it. They get in trouble. So it's a, it's a tough business to be a developer, either big or small. And we, you've seen a couple of them fail, and they had to pass off their projects or end their projects. Does the PUC look at the developer? Are you vetting developers that are coming before you in these RFPs? You know, I think we're going to have to do a, a, a look more closely at that. Um, when you have a power purchase agreement, it is really an agreement between the developer and Hawaiian Electric, and they enter into that agreement. When it comes to us, they're ask, Hawaiian Electric is really the applicant asking us to approve it. And we, what we have done now is we've taken a couple of steps. Uh, first of all, <clears throat> and we, I, I learned from the Sun Edison project where Hawaiian Electric, uh, um, sua sponte, I can use that legal term, yeah. terminated, it means on its own motion. <laughs> yeah, terminated the agreement. Yeah. After we, the, the PUC had gone through five or six years of this competitive bidding process, where we, we was eight, 13 companies, then it was down to eight, and we, we approved the four, uh, uh, three Sun Edison and Eurus. And after all that period of time, to have the utility say it's gone, it's power, no more contract. I, I, that's why we opened up an uh, investigative docket, was what is the basis of you doing that? We invested our time, energy, and effort in this, and you come along and say, it's gone. That's not cool with me. There's something about they were, they were in trouble. Though. Well, they were, there was a bankruptcy issue, yeah. but we had also looked at other information that we had that caused us to do the investigation. Mm -hmm. The fact that there was an impending bankruptcy uh, was, of course, great concern. The issue was, at least for me, was there appeared to have been a buyer stepping in and would have st stood in the shoes of Sun Edison. Why didn't you negotiate with them? because they were a substantial buyer. Um, so we want to, I, I think we ought to look at that some more so that there is no um, one party can say it's gone. That you come to, a, after we go to, and, uh, and we approve the PPA, you got to come to us and tell us we are going to terminate and we want your approval of that termination so that we can look at it as well. We have a different perspective than the utility company or the parties to that agreement. That was Sun Edison, yeah? That's right. And, and, and now we have NRG stepped into its place, 110 yeah. 10 megawatts now, which will help us with the R. That's why it was so important, uh, uh, Jay. When they terminated the three Sun Edison, it's 110 megawatts. Um, That's a lot. That was a That's lot. substantial percentage of the whole pie. It, 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 and, and, you know, when you just say go away, okay, now, and at, when they did that, on the books, there was nothing. There was no... Very little, if any, I don't recall any renewable projects that were on the books for Oahu. This island is um, the island that is lagging behind on achieving the uh, RPS goals yeah. in comparison with Kauai, Maui, and, and Hawaii. Yeah. And so we on this island, which will, and we're going to have, and I said it at the last program, my concern was Oahu, because we have limited land area, we have four-fifths of the population. How are we going to achieve that goal on this island. And um, right now, it's, it, it's iffy because we don't have geothermal. Uh, the land areas are, are small. And, and there's always the not in my backyard phenomenon. And, and there's, there's a lot of that because you have so much urban development, which I had to deal with when I was on the city council and ag and homes. And when they manured the field, um, you know, I'd get complaints. And they sh eventually shut down agriculture. So what are we going to do? We've got to keep pushing. Um, you know, look at, uh, on this island, are there pro prospects for hydro? And if so, what's the cost? If so, 
how much energy can it can can we produce? Um, what other areas of land, what other other land areas on this island that we can utilize? And what about battery storage? Yeah. What about um, um, micro, not, well, microgrid, a school being a microgrid? Right. Um, and community solar, too. And, and community, community solar, that's the other side. You get, we've got community solar, we've got time of use, we've got Brian K. Aloha doing a bang up job on energy efficiency. Yeah. All of those things have to be in play. And we cannot, you know, the, the, the one that got the most publicity, it's sort of like the, loud, the person, the loudest person in the room always gets the attention, which, which you know, it's... The reality. It's, yeah, I know. It's the 60s when you yell, you know, long hair and everything, um, and protesting. But, you know, it's... Um, so solar uh, um, became at the top of the mountain, but that's not enough. We have to be open to other things, and uh, whether it's wind, solar, with battery, wind with battery, hydro, um, hydrogen, um, and who knows in 10 years, some brain, in, in uh, brainy student in fifth grade today or 10th grade today is going to develop something that is just outstanding. And that's another thing I hope for, and I, I'm optimistic about. Yeah. We have to develop expertise. We have to be the best. We, we can find excellence right here. That's right. You know. Um, well, I, Jay, you know, today, my hero was John F. Kennedy. Today was, you know, he was assassinated. But it, we talked, I think we talked about it, the last guy. Just think about how you felt, how I felt, when this young president stood before Congress and said to them, by the end of the decade, we're going to go to the moon. It just uplifted you. It challenged you. It filled you with a sense of energy. STEM programs started to expand. Uh, engineering colleges started to expand. Uh, we'll get more enrollment. And, and all the spin-offs that came, Teflon, Velcro, um, but John Kennedy challenged us. And this, to me, is the, that new challenge, is the energy field, uh, the, the second frontier, the second new frontier. And that's what our kids can study. That's right. And they can stay home and, and do that that's in the right. laboratory of Hawaii's energy initiative. That, that is exactly right. And we always talk about that. Yeah. John Burns talked about it back in the 60s. If you read it, his biography, he was talking about the brain drain. Yeah. I was talking about it, you were talking about it when I was in office. Yeah. And this is a real possibility here. I mean, you know, for example, I mean, just, I just toss it out, it sounds kind of weird, but you know, can we do a uh, hydrogen production facility on the Big Island using geothermal and produce hydrogen and sell it? In and tanks, all over the place. All over the place. You know, that's just a small thing, but there are, I'm sure there are other things and you don't have to uh, go someplace else to be an energy expert in the state of Hawaii. Yeah. Randy, you're, you're so excited. You're, you have such vitality about this. <clears throat> Your term is going to be up in, what, 2020? Three years from now. Yeah, you've you got to continue. What do you think? What's your current? Last time we talked about this, you said it was all piled at the end. What, what do you think well, now? Well, what I, what I said was, this is my last trek through government. And... Um, you know, when 2020 comes around, I'm going to be, I'm going to be, oh, I'm going to be 70 this year. And you're you know, a young I, man. Well, as we, you know, and <laughs> I think it's wrong for our profession. Uh, judges got to retire. Yeah. I, I don't think they should have to. Yeah. Uh, they still got this. <laughs> but know. PUC commissioners don't have to retire. Yeah. Yeah, they don't have to. <laughs> uh, so we'll see um, where everything ends up in 2020. Um, but I, I, I came back because this, I, I you know, I'm, I just called it the second new frontier in honor of John Kennedy, but that's why I came back. Um, this the energy is not just powering your house or, or, the, or your television or your internet. It's about climate. It's about clean air. It's about preserving, um, bringing back the Hawaii I knew when I looked at Diamond Head on a non-foggy day, a foggy day. <laughs> you know, I want, I want, the, I want that. Yeah. Are you glad you came back? Yeah. Um, we have had some, ex it's, you know, per, for, on a personal level, I mean, it's been a long haul for me because I, I, I was retired for eight years. I had no expertise in the utility field. I, I still, I don't claim to be one. And, um, but I have a good, I, I think what I know is hire good people um, and then talk to them. And so 
that has been really good for me to have the, the people I've worked with um, to teach me. Uh, I, I am, I think, proficient at moving policy forward, and we have, and keeping things moving forward. And, um, you know, there were, there were disputes. Uh, it was highly controversial with the Nextera case, but I feel good that we made the right decision. Um, I don't want to be having to look back. Had we approved it, despite all of the defects, and see it fall apart, and then you say, okay, I was at fault with that. Yeah, wow. Yeah. Randy, so nice to see you. Nice to have you here. This well, Randy Iwasi, a chair of the PUC, uh, who, has, who has really enjoyed this, this job, and who, yes. in my opinion, has become more mellow and more extensible you know, than ever before in his entire <laughs> career, and he's really found a niche for himself. Thank you so much, Randy. Thank you, Jay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Aloha. And happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. To you, too. <laughs>